Discord on the computer. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Randy Labonte here from the Canadian eLearning Network uh, for our last webinar uh, of this particular school year. Um, and uh, welcome, Brett. Um, we just started. Uh, so um, if just in terms of the logistics I mentioned to you, you can change your screen and view in, in the top right hand corner where you can view the video or you can view the actual um, desktop that's being shared in Terry's presentation as well. And there's also a chat window if you don't have it active down on the lower part of your screen, you'll see an opportunity where you can click on the chat. There might be some text chat there or if you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat area as well. Uh, we welcome Terry Reed, who's the Learning Services Coordinator at Black Gold Regional School Division, as well as the Vice Chair of the Canadian eLearning Networks Board. Um, visionary, um, certainly, um, but an effective leader. And this presentation was one of the most well-received of the breakout sessions at the Canadian eLearning Networks uh, April Symposium uh, as well. And uh, Terry brings a wealth of experience, understanding, and insights to this, and looking forward to both learning from you, Terry, but also the dialogue that I know will ensue. And so make sure that if you have questions, that you uh, take some time to ask Terry because she will either provide you a, a sound answer or redirect it to somewhere where you can find that. So without further ado, Terry, looking forward to this. Thanks, Randy. Uh, it sounds like a lot to live up to, so I think I better try and stay on the mark here today. Thanks for joining me. Um, uh, the, my objective for today is to introduce curriculum mapping, explain to you exactly what it is and how it works, talk to you a little bit about how we've used it to improve our assessment practices within Black Gold and the impact that it's having on teaching practice and on uh, student achievement as a result of a change in teaching practice. So really curriculum mapping is a process through which we take curriculum alignment, curriculum pacing, and the mapping, and we put it all together into one really iterative cycle that we work on consistently. Uh, I guess really the question is what is curriculum mapping? And curriculum mapping is really a process that aligns all of the instructional programs, not only within a classroom, but it can also align them across classrooms when you're working within a school. Um, I'm going to say sometimes I talk a little fast, so if you have questions that you want to interrupt me with at any time, please feel free. I find it's uh, easier for all of our brains if we answer them while we're in the thick of something rather than wait till the end, so don't hesitate to jump in with a question if you have one. Curriculum mapping also is a really a procedure. It's, not, it's less of a thing and more of a procedure that allows us to keep that operational database of what we're doing with curriculum. And by curriculum, I have used intentionally the small c curriculum. So we're talking about learning outcomes, learning and teaching resources, and assessments, and how they all collectively interplay to, to bring us a curriculum to life in the classroom. But more than anything, it aligns all of those skills and processes that set the stage really for a dynamic uh, opportunity to create authentic assessment for students in the classroom first thing we need to understand is what we're assessing and why we're assessing and then we can get to the how of assessing. So why do we curriculum map? Um, ultimately we spend some time starting with the front matter or subject introduction depending on where you are in the country what it's called. Uh, it's really about the big picture. What, why do we do what we do in a discipline or a subject? Why do we do the things that we do when we're teaching science? Why do we do the things that we're doing when we're teaching math or English language arts or French language arts? All of those questions are really important for a teacher to start with. It's really interesting when we've brought teachers together and spent some time going through the front matter. It doesn't matter if they've been teaching for six months or 30 years, myself included. Every time I read a front matter again, I notice something different. So it's a really great opportunity for, for that piece to come together but it also helps us understand the outcomes. Teachers talk curriculum. They spend some time saying, what does this mean to you? Oh, I thought it meant this. And so that conversation is really important to bring everyone to that really solid understanding of what the outcomes mean and what it is to bring them to life. It also lets us talk about resources. Um, it's really interesting that teachers who've spent time with me curriculum mapping know that they shouldn't talk about the textbook to me because the textbook isn't actually their program of studies. The learning outcomes are not all in the textbook. 
and no textbook covers everything. So part of what we need to do is figure out what's left out in those resources and what's extraneous so that we can move that. By starting with the end in mind, really understanding those outcomes, we get to that point where teachers know where to stop in the development of an outcome and in the teaching in the classroom. We all live in a helping prof profession. We want our kids to be successful. We want everyone to learn as much as they can. And inherently, teachers will stretch beyond what an outcome says because they're trying to give students more and more and more. Well, realistically, if we want our students to be super successful, if we can dial back the scope of what we're teaching them and bring that down to the outcome, they get to spend more time really deeply understanding that outcome. And when they can understand that outcome better, they're obviously better positioned for success in the long run. Then the last thing is, if we understand our outcomes, then we can actually align our assessments to the outcomes and ensure that we're assessing what it is we're supposed to be teaching. And, and that's always interesting. Uh, curriculum mapping is a process that allows us to make a shift. And it shifts us from textbooks being curriculum to, I've had people, a lot of people come to the session saying, well, we decided we were just gonna pick up the essential outcomes and teach those. And as far as I know across Canada, every outcome that is printed in a curriculum is expected to be taught, which means they must all be essential. So it shifts us to using curriculum maps that align outcomes, skills, and processes along with the knowledge. It also lets us shift our assessments. Um, most textbooks, most resources come with a set of assessments along with them and we take those assessments and we use them in a classroom. It's wonderful. Someone's given me this polished binder to teach from and it's easy when you're strapped for time to use that to assess your students. It allows us to move from that to ultimately how do we make sure that we're assessing all of the outcomes, skills and processes that have come together in our curriculum map. So it's that really important shift that takes us from aligning to a program to the actual outcomes that's vital in the process. And then the final piece, it shifts our instruction. It shifts us from instruction based on a program or a set of resources to ultimately instruction that is keenly focused on outcomes that we've put together in a curriculum map. So, we see curriculum mapping as a really cyclical process. We start by understanding the learning outcomes. From that, we figure out what it looks like to be successful, provide the teaching, assess the learning, use those results to better understand the curriculum outcomes. And the more we can sort of focus on this cycle, the stronger things will be for our kids in the classroom. Through curriculum mapping, one thing that comes out is it reminds us to share the learning targets with our students. It's, I, if I walked into a room and I gave you a set of darts and I said, please get the highest score you can. And that's all I said, nothing more. It's really difficult for you to figure out what that score is. But by giving kids the target, today we're going to learn about how to find the square root of a number. Now they know wherever I go in my lesson, wherever I, I wander around the room, ultimately what I expect them to know at the end of the lesson is how to find the square root of a number. We're actually fairly, um, we've done some research into looking at the outcomes and how we share those most effectively with kids. And there are, are a lot of people who have been rewriting the outcomes in, to make them into what they call more kid-friendly language. Terry, yeah, it's it's Brett here. Hi. I wanted to ask this question before I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so, I, I I certainly understand and get the the value and importance of curriculum mapping. Without trying to get you going off on a completely different tangent, okay. Tell me, I guess I'd love to hear your thoughts on the up and coming new curriculum and 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 I we've looked at you know, the, the scope and sequence to that, um, what it's headed towards. I'm relatively optimistic as to the cross um, uh, 
um, subject-based type of ideas. I'm interested to hear what your thoughts and, and anyone else, please jump in that has ideas around this, around what you feel needs to happen in order to overcome some of the, we'll call them historical slash traditional um, boundaries, barriers, whatever you want to, that may get in the way with actually achieving that cross-curricular type of goal. That's a great question, Brett. And actually, you're not going to take me far off what I'm talking about today. <laughs> um, the reason that we've embarked on curriculum mapping here in Alberta in Black Gold is partially as a curriculum change readiness strategy. If we are successful in getting all of our teachers talking about curriculum, what are outcomes, what do they look like? And we give them space and time and place and guidance to do that effectively. Then when curriculum shifts, they will be really well positioned to see what's the same and what's different. And they'll be used to looking closely at outcomes, first and foremost. But something else that you'll see a little later in the presentation is part of what we do is also look at when I'm developing a curriculum map in a grade, let's say it's grade five, science, social, math, English language arts, it creates room and space for me to say, and where do I find some commonalities across these? In language arts, it says I need to look at various types of text. Well, guess what? In social studies, we're looking at various texts. So I'm going to use that opportunity from the language arts program that says I have to look at different types of text to be more critical in how I look at those texts in social studies or in science or in math. And so within curriculum mapping, there's space to already get us to some cross-curricular pieces. And so we're trying to break those traditional boundaries and barriers before we get there so that it isn't, we don't feel like somebody picked up the bathtub, shook us upside down and, and we're standing naked and don't know what to do. So we're just trying to make sure everyone has the tools to understand really deeply what we're doing now so that they can make the shift to whatever comes next. I, I appreciate that. That, that actually um, would echo similar strategies to what we're doing within our school district is just, just starting with administrators first, because knowing those administrators are going to go back and have conversations, we want to then allow for actually very much what you said, time to have those conversations amongst the teachers to, to establish those connections. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And, you know, coming back to this slide, part of that is uh, we ask people to use the current vocabulary of outcomes and not to, to rewrite them. Um, initially, I got a lot of pushback from my grade one teachers, but, but my kids don't understand the big words that are in a curriculum. It's important that we use the language with them because part of understanding in a discipline is understanding the language of the discipline. And I don't know a single grade one kid who doesn't know what a Tyrannosaurus Rex is, or who doesn't know um, other names, big words from dinosaurs. They use them. Vocabulary is first learned by talking. And so we need to have that conversation with our kids using the appropriate um, conversation. So when we're talking about online courses, all of these things work exactly the same way. If you start your online course development with first a curriculum map, then you know that what you're doing is going to make sense for student learning and that you're going to address all of the outcomes. And as you'll see a little bit later, it gives you some time to be really reflective in terms of your assessment within that online course which pieces should I assess in which style and how? And, and that'll come up in a few slides and I'll talk further about that. So, so sorry to jump in and follow, that was more a reflective question at this point in time, because you're describing an iterative process. So to me, it sounds like curriculum mapping should be, become part of an instructional design approach in planning for courses as well in online. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, and it's an integral part of the initial instructional design process that we use when we're developing our online courses here. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to give you a glimpse of mapping right now and sort of what it looks like and what we do. So 
you'll notice that despite the fact that I'm really a tech person and anyone who's ever been anywhere with me knows that the first thing I pull out is a device, <laughs> not a pen or paper. You'll see on the, on the tables, lots of pieces of paper. And we found this to be the most effective strategy to move forward, uh, to actually print out the outcomes and they're on different colors of paper grouped according to general outcomes. So all of the specific outcomes from one topic are on this table pink. Uh, another set that align with the general outcome are yellow, green, etc. And we give them to those teachers and we get them to say what makes sense. This is a time when we ask them actually to step away from current practice. I know that I always teach things in this order because that's the order the textbook goes. Is there an opportunity to just look at the outcomes and say, what makes sense to develop these in a logical order that's going to connect in a kid's brain? And how is that going to work? And so we take some time to do it by making it digital and letting them move things around. It becomes, it's less overwhelming and it's a, a lot easier for people to deal with. So the next piece we do is have them have some really deep conversations and find some common ground. You'll notice in the diagram on the left, we still have the same colors seem to be grouped together a lot. It's like, oh, well, this is all general outcome one, so I have to teach them all together. And the diagram on the right, or the picture on the right, you see that they're starting to blend the colors together, and they're starting to say, the outcome from general outcome one, and something from general outcome two, and something from general outcome three, if we put those together, we're actually painting a picture for our students that makes a logical flow of of the entire concept instead of piecemealing it together and how that's going to fit. So you'll notice that pretty quickly things start to blend together and, and come into different colors. So once that process is agreed upon, then we really do a, a deep dive. We start to figure out what are those outcome means, we talk about them. And this is really where all the skeletons come out of the closet. This is where someone says, I've never taught that outcome, ever. I have never taught it because it doesn't make sense to me. Or they start to say, I don't really understand what that means. I had a group of grade six math teachers and one teacher put their hand, can you just, I don't understand what this outcome means. So we talked around the room, not one of the teachers understood the outcome. Excellent moment for us to say, okay, what does it mean? What does it look like? And what could it look like in a classroom? So we really pull that together a lot and support them in, in deeper learning of exactly what those outcomes are about. It also gives us then the opportunity to examine any illustrative examples that are provided, achievement indicators, whatever other supports come with your curriculum. In Alberta, some of them have each of those items. What do you do well in your classrooms? And what do you struggle with? Um, what are those things you haven't been doing at all or that you've been doing way beyond what it says? It says you're to identify all of the regions of land in Brazil. Well, actually, I've been making my kids identify, analyze, compare, contrast. Oh, you don't have to. The outcome says identify. So let's scale that back to just what the outcome is addressing. And then every student in that classroom has the way to um, be successful instead of just a few. At that point, we start to digitize the, the uh, curriculum. And this is where some true networking begins and people start to share resources and share connections and really move things forward. But they're really beginning to record the organization of what they're doing for um, in a digital format. Sorry, I just did get distracted by the questions. Randy, if there's something there I should answer, you're gonna poke me, right? No, that's just me pontificating again, Terry. Okay. You know. Awesome. So then what's the impact on our teachers? Really the first thing is all the ahas and comments that they make. They make connections within their own curriculum that they've never made before. Oh, look, there's a little thread that runs through here and it's through all of the general outcomes but I can pick out a little piece in each of them. When I put that together, it actually does paint a complete picture for my kids. And we've had that happen in a grade 12 math class and a grade one English language arts class. So we see it happen completely across the board. 
It also allows them to make links between courses, not just within. So Brett, as we do this and we have people who participate in more, more than one map, so if you teach more than one subject, you're coming in and going, wait a minute, um, we did something like that. I have an outcome from English language arts that sounds kind of like that math outcome. Let's look at both of those together and see what they look like. Ultimately, we give them time to have conversations about outcomes and how is that a bad thing? It's great. It, it, what's the depth and the degree of understanding we're looking for from our kids? That's what we need to look for. Um, what are the common frustrations about certain outcomes? I don't like this one. I don't know how to do it with my kids. It doesn't make sense. Um, how do we make plans to address those things that are frustrating? We really look at the competencies and the skills and the processes that are required and how do we feed them through. In Alberta, the science curriculum has a set of skills listed consistently across the curriculum, but they aren't really tied to all of the other outcomes. So this gives us that opportunity to say, when is this skill going to come alive? Where's a knowledge outcome that this skill is linked to that we can actually develop with our students? Um, we really talk a lot at this point at introducing versus reinforcing versus completing, mastering, assessing, whatever you want for that final term. And this is where the conversation about assessment really starts to move forward. Um, because we, we look at that outcome and, and we say, so do you expect, I know that on your map you put that in September, do you expect your kids to completely understand that in September? Well, no, I don't expect them to completely understand it till January. Okay, that's great to know. Are you assessing them and giving them an exam in September that counts towards their final mark? Yes. Why? You don't even expect them to know it until January. So how can we shift our, start to shift our assessment practices? And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but how do we now start to shift them to align with are thinking of when am I introducing a concept versus reinforcing it versus completing it. And uh, there's a few teachers who hung on to that word master it, but a lot of our teachers have abandoned that word because I have yet to completely master anything. I started in the world of education 35 years ago and I don't think I'm, I'm a master teacher. I don't think I've mastered everything to do with education, but I, I think that I've completed different components along the way. And so it's just that shift. It also display, uh, shows us some follow-up projects. Uh, in social studies in junior high, we realized through this process that none of our teachers were teaching two active citizenship outcomes that are in grade seven, eight, and nine, and they scaffold from one grade to another. And when we had the conversation about why they weren't addressing them, no one knew where to start. No one knew how to get moving on it. So the follow-up that we planned from that is after our curriculum mapping session, we brought together four teachers, we created some projects, shared it with all of the social studies teachers, and made them so that there are multiple choices for teachers and kids. Now you can use these to address those outcomes. But if we didn't do the mapping process, we would have never known we had that gap. So identifying that gap gives us that opportunity to plug it. And the final thing is that discussion that happens amongst colleagues. Um, in grade three, I, we had a grade three math teacher who, I know it says they have to know their five times fives, but I insist my kids learn up to seven times seven. Okay, two minutes before that, we had looked at an outcome that said that kids had to skip count backwards as well as forwards. And her comment was, I don't have time to teach them how to skip count backwards. So once we got to the next point and, and she was going beyond in her multiplication tables, what we were able to do is buy her that time back. Only go to five times five, because that's the outcome. But now make sure you're skip counting forwards and backwards, because that's the outcome. So by starting to address those outcomes, we can really get to where we need to go. Um, I had the grade nine and grade 10 math teachers together, and I had a grade 10 math teacher say to a grade nine teacher. Is that one of those interesting pivotal moments that we all see happening in PD, where it was an in the face. If you grade nine teachers did a better job of teaching cube roots and Y slope intercept, my job would be easier. 
grade nine teacher who had already been through his mapping process said, that might be very true, but those are not outcomes of the grade math curriculum. Those are outcomes of the grade 10 math curriculum. So that really is a job that belongs to your grade, not to mine. So it really lets people own that vertical alignment as well as that horizontal alignment and moves it forward in a different way. I'm going to take a minute now and show you some different maps of curriculum, uh, some different curriculum maps that we've created and the models that they look like. It's really important to understand when we do our curriculum mapping, we give them some guidelines, but, but then uh, we expect them to look very different. And that even within one subject and one grade, maps could look different. The first one that I've put up for you here is English Language Arts 5. And this group um, chose to go by month. So you can see September through June across the top. Then anywhere there's a yellow block, that's when they're introducing a concept. The green blocks, they're reinforcing. And the pink blocks, they expect them to be competent, proficient with them. So once they get this map done, you can see where we can start to have our conversations about assessment based on what they've put together in their maps. So that's uh, the first one. The next one is a grade six science course. And the grades, this, this particular group of grade six science teachers had a huge disagreement about which unit should be taught first, which one could be second, which one should be third. And so what they chose to do was to develop each unit separately. You can see across the bottom, there's uh, different tabs, trees and forests, uh, air and flight, sky science. So now any teacher can take this map and move it forward. And then they've just determined collectively how many weeks it would take to teach that unit. So now I could do evidence first, and Brett, you could do trees and forest first, and Elise, you could do sky science first, and it would all be fine because we have our map together. Um, from a question from Angela was, how do we provide room for growth in the classroom and still ensure we're only teaching the program of studies? That's a fantastic question. Uh, and it's one that comes up every time we bring teachers together. My job as a teacher is to teach the outcomes in my grade. If I am trying to support students who are um, in our inclusive edit model in Alberta, in Alberta, we would call them code 80 students or gifted students. My job as a teacher is not to teach them beyond my curriculum. If I am teaching grade eight science and I want them to do grade nine science, then I should let them do grade nine science. If I'm teaching grade eight science and they want to go beyond, then I find other projects that still align with our program of studies that let them go deeper into understanding that concept. If they are able to learn more content, that's great. But really, um, the exploration that gifted kids generally want to do is to go deeper and understand it better and do projects that allow them to connect more dots. If we have a student who wants accelerated learning, then they can go to the next grade and pick that up. And especially when we have kids in our online courses, I know you're in grade eight, but you're doing grade nine science. But if they are doing grade eight science, then they stay in grade eight science. So individualizing the program or letting kids explore things. If you have a gifted kid, they're going to come up with their own project. Give them some parameters and say, these are the concepts that we're working with. You write a project and bring it to me and let's have a conversation. And if students are able to do that, then they're able to go deeper. Does that answer your question, Angela? So I'm wondering if we can go back to what Paul had mentioned as well uh, about the focus on content and my comment about so many outcomes that need to be covered in secondary. Um, how successful have you been with curriculum mapping, say at senior science teachers at the secondary, senior secondary level? Phenomenally successful. Um, first thing is, it, and it comes back to knowing where to stop, it's, it's reinforcing for teachers where to stop. And if everyone taught, completely taught every outcome and stopped at the end of it, then our, we find that our students are better prepared for the next grade and it's, it's able to bring them back together. Um, 
it's interesting that you bring up senior science and talk about the volume of outcomes because honestly in Alberta grade 7 science has more outcomes than any other course I would much rather teach physics 20 and the number of outcomes in there than grade 7 science so we have that idea that the we have more outcomes where we get into the uh, high school grades, but the reality is not always the case. So the, it still comes back to what is it I'm supposed to teach and how do I make sure that I'm teaching that? And I said teaching that, not covering that, because those are two different things in, in our mind. So I'm gonna come back and show you a few more models here. In grade four science, this one was very interesting. Um, they took a different approach than the other groups did, but you'll notice the dark orange keeps coming back. It's in September, December, February, March. What they decided is that waste in your, our world is something that really thematically flows through every piece of the grade four science curriculum. So they are going to take that unit and split it up throughout the year and keep revisiting it and weaving it through and showing those connections to how that recycling comes to us in, in terms of light and how does it come to us in terms of energy and how does it come to us in terms of mechanical pieces. And so they just kept threading that through. Um, and then the last group that I want to show you is Social Nine. And in Social Nine, they rearranged the outcomes in the order they wanted to teach them. But the cool thing they did was take each set of outcomes and put them on their own tab. So this would be a unit. And now you can see where we're starting to link all of their shared resources in. So this is a group of teachers collectively sharing resources. And those resources come from different people and they pop them in together. Now our curriculum map is actually becoming a powerful uh, tool for them to use. And one thing we've noted is when those teachers start breaking them into tabs, they start to see the curriculum as more doable. It's chunked up. It's less overwhelming. And those are the comments that come directly from our teachers. So it's not us guessing that, it's really them. Now I wanna move on and talk about assessment a little bit. So the four basic questions we ask are why, what, how, and when do we assess? Why do we assess is a really interesting piece. Um, I'm curious to know from this group what your thoughts are on why do we bother to assess? What, what is the reason for it? Go ahead and grab the microphone or throw something in the chat window. What is the purpose of assessment? Why do we do it? Isn't it based on the whole accountability? structure that and that theme that underlies all of public education absolutely we have to let parents know we have to let the government know we have to provide a mark to those kids that's certainly why we assess in okay. alberta we have something sorry someone was answering there go ahead and i'll come back in alberta we have something called the teaching quality standards and one of the teaching quality standards talks about using assessment to guide your instruction. And so it is something that we expect our teachers to become proficient at, but we never really teach them how to do that in pre-service. And we don't always support them in doing that afterwards. So part of assessment needs to be, I've assessed my classroom. If the whole class fails, it's not about giving them a failing mark and moving on. It's about saying, wow, I need to adjust my instruction now because my students didn't understand. So that's my opportunity to get feedback on this particular strategies I'm using with that group of students. It doesn't make me a better or worse teacher if I don't get through to them. It gives me an opportunity to adjust my strategies. Paul, go ahead. Your point is exactly the same when we talk about Ontario and uh, you assess, well, you assess, you want to know where the student is and you want to accompany the student uh, through uh, the, the learning process and guide the student so that uh, one comes, when the time comes for what we would call summative assessment, uh, we've been able to help the student 
get ready for that summative assessment and, and uh, basically to be able to, to have success during the learning process, all, all the way through the learning process. So that it's, it's, it, it goes, it's, it's true that it, there is a, a question of a, accountability to the students, to the schools, to the parents, to the community and to the government. But uh, I think the, 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 the most important piece is working with the student to become a better, a, a better learner. Absolutely. And, and you've hit upon the final piece, and that is not just so that we can change our instructional practices, but it's also so that we can support our students in becoming a better learner. And what is it that we then can work with them in terms of other competencies to make them uh, better learners so that they can move forward. Um, Dirk, finding tools to, to organize resources around outcomes, our curriculum maps do that for us now. Because we have a curriculum map Teachers link their resources directly into the curriculum maps, and this becomes their long-range plan that they submit to their principal. It's something that they have in their classroom. Um, they're encouraged to print out sets of outcomes for a unit to students so that they can track where they are. Um, and we're using a program called PowerSchool, is our student information system. And with that, uh, the gradebook that we're using has a spot for us to upload outcomes. So I have uploaded all of the learning outcomes from kindergarten through grade 12 into our MARCS program. We're not doing outcomes-based assessment. We're doing outcomes-focused assessment. So that means you can still record. I'm giving an assignment on Shakespeare's Hamlet, and I can use that title in my assignment book or in my MARCS book. Then the teachers are asked to, to select from a drop-down menu, as I said, I've preloaded all of the outcomes, which outcomes they're addressing with that assignment. And then within the MARCS program, they can, there's a piece called the Professional Judgment Helper, and they can look at a glance and see, oh, I've, hit, I've addressed this outcome 10 times and I've missed these 14 outcomes. I've never addressed them. So it helps them shift their work a little bit too, just by tracking. So in terms of tracking Dirk, it, it's a matter of uh, just looking differently at supporting teachers without throwing the baby out in the bathwater, I guess. The what do we assess is pretty simple. We assess outcomes and we do it through a variety of tasks, tests, projects, and performance tasks. And the how we assess, Paul has already alluded to, we need to make sure we're doing formative and summative assessment. But the when we assess is the piece that takes us back to our curriculum map. The when we assess combined with the how we assess are really important to us. Because if we think of those curriculum maps, when we're introducing something, our assessment should be formative. We have already consciously said we're introducing this concept. If we are introducing this concept, then why are we summatively assessing it? Because I can tell you the first time I went to tie my shoes as a little kid, I sucked. I was terrible. But I didn't fail at shoe tying. I tie my shoes all the time now. But that zero that I got in tying my shoes over and over and over and over didn't stick with me. So I'm not a 60% shoe tire now. I'm 100% shoe tire now. But if we start to assess summatively too early, we hang an albatross on our students that they cannot overcome because they can't defeat that zero unless and until we allow ourselves to replace that zero with a new achievement mark. So if we're going to do a summative assessment early, then where are the opportunities to move forward. And those are the pieces that are really important. So introducing has to be some, has to be formative from our perspective. When you're reinforcing, again, if that's summative, it's only if you're allowed to replace that grade. As now I've got it. Now I've got it. In, in September, I did not understand this. But in January, I got it. Your curriculum map says that's when you expect me to get it. So I should get the 80%. I shouldn't be hounded by the 20% and the 30% and the 40% that 
to give me an average mark of 53. Because in January, I know that. I have an 80% on that content. And so our assessment practices then start to shift to align with the map. And so hopefully you can see where that mapping piece starts to really come in, into play. The next piece that we tie through the assessment is that we start to look at blueprinting our assessments. Really simple blueprinting. So on this quiz that we're going to give students, we're going to address two outcomes. This is a grade eight language arts uh, uh, test. And you can see the first outcome, we have a K and E. In Alberta, we have a knowledge and employability strand, which is a lower academic strand that students can enter in grade eight. So we've already said, I've planned for that. There's my differentiated in, uh, assessment right there. It's very clear. So that's what I'm going to do. Look at that. My assessment is done. I know that I'm addressing these two outcomes. Now I can create them. Instead, we had a question bank from a publisher. We load it up. We pick the 10 questions that look good. We give it. I have been guilty of that. I taught high school math. I mean, the first time I blueprinted, I assessed one outcome 25 times and I did not touch any of the other outcomes. Well, that wasn't very good for my kids, but man, my class average was great because I, I really nailed that outcome well. So creating the blueprint ahead of time, again, it's about what comes first. It's putting um, our planning first, it's backwards design. It really allows us to maintain our focus on outcomes while we are assessing instead of now I'm finished teaching, so I'm gonna test something over here using different tools that we've never talked about. And I'm just gonna find these cool tasks on teachers pay teachers because it looks good and it's Sunday night and I need something for tomorrow. If we can shift that back to what are the outcomes that we're assessing and what does that look like? And the, I mean, there's so many benefits from blueprinting. Blueprinting, I, we encourage our teachers to give the kids that blueprint. So if I go back to that slide, lots of our kids will get this to study for the exam. This is what you're going to be assessed on. I'm not hiding that from you. This is not a, a, a profession where we're trying to trick students and make it hard for them and trip them up. This is a profession where we, we want to help them. So Here's what I'm going to assess you on. I'm going to assess you on identifying and explaining implicit and explicit ideas and analyze choices and motives of characters and explain the insight to self and others. Those are the two things. That's all I'm going to assess you on. So now the kids can study on that. If, they're not, if they don't do well on it, you can have a conversation with the parents about those are the outcomes that you're focused on. By shifting to blueprinting, it also allows us to have that conversation with parents to say, this is where a student is weak. How many times does a parent come in to have a conversation with the teacher and the teacher's like, well, they need to study more. Students continually, when they have to study, will pick up their content and start with what they know best because it doesn't tax their brain. But if I can give to them and their parents this is the outcome or outcomes that you're weakest at. These are the ones that you need to focus on. Now I give them a path to move forward to success instead of saying, just study more, which throws the blame on them instead of giving them the scaffold and the support to actually understand how to move that forward. So really in blueprinting, you see all of these pieces come together for them and it, maintains that really strong link to learning outcomes. Tell them what you're focusing on, follow through on your focus and let it go forward. When we talk to our teachers, we ask them, what was the value of this whole process? Because we invested $150,000 in a pilot to work with 120 teachers this year. And uh, we needed to know if it was of any value to continue. I needed to know if I was going to still work here next year because but this was my big plan. So we got some interesting feedback from our teachers. They, it was amazing to give them permission to stop was one of the biggest things that they valued to know this is how much I have to teach of the content. And that's all. I don't have to go beyond. I don't have to build a house. I just have to build the foundation. 
So get the foundation built and do it well. And then when the students have to build the walls next year and put on a roof the following year, they will really know each of their skills and are will capable to, to do that. Um, it's also been amazing as we've moved forward, uh, Brett, back to your question, looking at the new scope, draft scope and sequence in the Alberta curriculum. We've had teachers who've been focused on what verbs mean in curriculum mapping. When I brought teachers back in to look at the draft scope and sequence, I could tell who'd been in for curriculum mapping. They were circling verbs. They were seeing if there was an appropriate development of, those, of the verbiage in the outcomes from one grade to another. They were starting to look at those things. So we really did have some, some solid connections in learning on the teacher's part. So we know that we're having a difference. What was the impact on teaching? Well, the first thing is I walk into a school and into a staff room and teachers are talking about outcomes. That's never happened before. And they're talking about what are you using for this outcome because I haven't found anything yet that supports that. It's also created connections between schools because when we're mapping, we bring teachers in from different schools to work collaboratively together. So uh, I'll get an email from somebody. I can't remember the name of that teacher out at that small school in Warburg. She had a great unit. Can you give me your email address? And they're starting to connect offline and create true communities of practice instead of ones that we've created for them that never worked. Um, but it, most importantly, it's changed the way that our teachers assess because they know what to assess. They focus on the outcomes. They make sure that their questions are aligned to the outcomes, not questions that come from a question bank that was really cool to find, but on the outcomes. Teachers feel supported in doing formative assessment for those outcomes that can only be assessed formatively. There are current outcomes in Alberta's curriculum, one of them in language arts that says, students shall demonstrate an appreciation of poetry. So did they get 62 in that or 73? Or do you formatively assess them? And that even took us to the conversation. One teacher said, I have two kids who absolutely hate poetry, so they would fail that every time. Conversation then shifted to, but isn't saying that they hate poetry, demonstrating their level of appreciation for poetry. What does the outcome ask the student to do? To be able to say what and why, how they feel about it, and to give some supporting evidence. So it, it really allows them to come together and, and find those tools instead of us finding it. It also has given our teachers room to have fewer summative assessment um, tasks and give students opportunities to revisit those summative assessment tasks so that their marks can change and they're not brand, branded with the scarlet letter of failure the first time that they do an assessment, but they have an opportunity to build on that and to move things forward. It's also changed the order in which some of our teachers instruct. And finally, it's really brought them together to share resources in a way that they've never done before. We gave them a survey to say what was the, what was the value of curriculum mapping, and I'm not gonna read that to you, but obviously networking with other teachers was at the top of the list. And everything else was really talking about making sure that instruction was better for our students. So then we say, where do we go from here? If we've done this mapping and we've seen that it's had some value, the question is, what can we do to follow up? So they've asked us to bring them back in after one year so that they can tweak their maps and assess their effectiveness. We already have that in the plans. More opportunities to collaborate with teachers. We're changing our professional development model to provide more opportunities for this to happen. It's also given us opportunities for improving assessment connected to outcomes. Already throughout this year, we have us two self-directed PD days where teachers can decide what they want to do. And they have on their own, those 120 teachers have come together on their days where they can do whatever they want to develop better assessment that aligns with their outcomes. Some of them have invited me to tag along and see, and some of them has just shared with me the results of their day. 
but they've taken control over what it is that they're doing. And finally, it's created opportunities for teachers to demonstrate and share their teaching strategies for specific outcomes, and they want to continue to do that. So again, we're gonna make opportunities for them to do that. So it, it really is, in order to improve assessment in our classrooms, we need to understand the outcomes, and it's, it comes way back to backwards design. So if we think back to when we first started to hear about backwards design, start with the end in mind, that to us is sort of become the, the norm. And so next year, we will be doing this process with every other teacher in our school division. We have three universities around us who are coming out to observe because they don't do this with pre-service teachers. And yet the first thing we ask pre-service teachers to do, provide me a long range plan. There is one university in Alberta that talks at all about long range plans and they only do unit plans. They never do year plans. So our poor first year teachers, we throw them into the fire, ask them to plan an entire year and they have no idea where to start. So part of curriculum mapping is we can say to a first year teacher who hasn't had a chance to go through the process yet, here's a potential model you may want to follow. And ultimately we're gonna start, after we've been through this process with every teacher, we'll be posting our maps online for our teachers to access and bounce in and out of and share resources. Does anyone have any questions or comments? That I, I think there was something going in the background that Brett was um, commenting as well. And, and my, I'm curious about, I uh, made a few comments. Uh, and when you make those changes uh, in a, a pilot or in an area with a group of teachers or in a particular school, um, how does that translate against the rest of the system? So if I'm working with the backwards design and I'm focusing on outcomes and I get all the students to the outcomes and they all get A's in the class because of that, how does that fit with those that have the conception of the bell curve or the notion of, you know, uh, provincial, you know, sort of approaches? And Brett's comment was about the fact that if we're better in the, the classroom and that will equate necessarily to provincial exams or, or um, district exams that might, might be in play. But, but I'm curious how, whether or not there's any pushback from others because I've seen it where those that have gone down into inquiry-based approaches, outcomes-based approaches, uh, get stymied because of the bureaucracy they're surrounded in? Um, we don't have a bell curve model here in Black Gold at all. Students all earn what they earn and we don't adjust those marks. Um, provincially, Alberta Education does have a little equating going on in some of their provincial exams, but uh, ultimately students earn what they earn. I can't tell you if it's making a difference on provincial exams until the fall when we get our results back from uh, this year. Our initial look at the January exams is showing an increase for those teachers who were part of mapping versus those teachers who weren't, but I need to see it replicated again before I can feel like there's any correlation. Could have just been a blip. We all have those blips. Um, we're not university and no one better be applying a bell curve. And if they are, then we should all stand up as educators and fight that because our students aren't bell curve students. We're not talking about a homogeneous grouping that's going to be evenly distributed in K to 12. We are talking about individual students who are all over the map and they need to achieve and earn what they've earned. And I will march on any hill that tries to bell curve us. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll send you to my university that I teach at that tried to push a bell curve at us. Yeah, it's well stated, Terry. Your 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 passion is is uh, far beyond black gold. I would say that there's unlikely a school district in the province that would even entertain the notion today of such a an idea. Yeah. They all get A's. So be it. They are, if they deserve it, they deserve the A, period. That's it. Uh, we're there to, to help students achieve their full potential. Some students will be, will be able to, uh, to attain their full potential faster than others, but, but that's not a problem. We're there to work with all of the students. Uh, so yeah, I agree 100% what you've said, Terry. 
not all universities are with us yet. And I think that's something that we, that we need to work on. Um, I think that if universities, I'm going to say something that I know this is recorded, so it may come back to bite me someday, but universities who are there to give me your money and I'll make sure you get through are faster to apply that bell curve so that they can demonstrate an even distribution of students who are paying for a degree. That's my opinion. Yeah, Brett, are you talking about, um, Randy, are you talking about universities in the West Coast? Because that does happen more in universities, but it's more pay for your degree than actually achieve. It, it was a comment to my own teaching in post-secondary institutions, not in K-12. I haven't been in the K-12 teaching situation for me to formulate an opinion, although I have them. Yeah. Terry, uh, yes. can you hear me? Yeah. I'm having some bandwidth issues, uh, and you may have uh, addressed this already. I'm curious to 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 know what was the motivation for you uh, for you guys to 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 have this going. Uh, was there something you you noticed over the years, maybe, or um, some particular need you wanted to address? Or uh, I'm hearing universities aren't addressing what uh, you know what 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 you're doing. So, is that possible for you to describe a little bit? That's a, that's a great question, Dirk. I'm in a pretty unique position here in Black Gold in that I'm in charge of online and blended learning, curriculum and instruction, and uh, first year teacher coaching. And when I look at the confluence of those three roles, and I started to dig data into where we were having trouble in all of those areas, in order to get a strong professional development plan going, you need to have um, some data and create some visions. Um, with collectively with the people involved in, in your education system. And we started to look at uh, some weaknesses in our assessment practices overall and some real inconsistencies that were hit and miss and teachers themselves reported that. Um, so then we started to look at what's the best way to impact assessment. And we've tried a few projects in the last few years. And we're really, everyone's really excited about it while we're in the room, but then it goes away and it doesn't continue. So um, this came out of the, the realization, I guess, uh, through some research that understanding your outcomes is the key to assessing your outcomes. And if we want to improve assessment, then we need to start by improving our understanding of outcomes. And we piloted, we actually started our pilot a year ago, and I started with grade five teachers uh, in May of 2016. And by this fall, we realized that the power of it was so strong that we moved it to all uh, K-12 to in a pilot form and then are going division-wide next year because everyone is talking about it in black gold. And people who aren't doing it want in on it. Does that answer your question? Good. Well, I want to thank you all for giving up some time this afternoon and for listening to me babble for a while. It's, uh, it's difficult to, to um, have a real interactive session in a webinar when I'm trying to share so much content. So I apologize for babbling so much and not having you uh, talk more. That's not my uh, favorite method of delivery. No, Terry, I, 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 it was terrific because there was a lot of really salient and important information. And I don't know, I'm not actively, as I say, post-secondary, not in K-12 and not in a situation of adopting and adapting to new curricular changes uh, or in, the, in this similar situation or system. But I think there was a lot of discussion back and forth that did come from that. But, but what I take away is that you have a structured process, that you had agreement and buy-in from everyone. You are managing the process of its implementation and assessing uh, the results and its impact uh, effectively and importantly. And you have a mindset across the school division to uh, embrace and do this. So you've got everyone from senior management level all the way down to the classroom level that are moving in a similar fashion. And I've seen that approach work effectively uh, Ottawa Catholic is doing uh, an, a lot of deep learning. They're doing a lot more in inquiry and outcomes-based and 
maker spaces and seeing that, but, but just the, the vibrancy is that it is a cohesive um, division approach that's being done. And I'm wondering, you know, if, if others agree that unless you've got that right across and you keep it as a process that you're necessarily um, may not be as successful uh, in the approach. I don't know whether there's any thoughts or comments on that. Okay, we can open up the mics. We can all talk if we want. I can turn off the recording too. <laughs> we want to talk in school. Actually, I think I will do that. I'll say formally, thank you, Terry. And then let's get into some discussion afterwards. <laughs>